So it's a great pleasure to have uh, Dr. Raghu Mahajan from Stanford Institute for Theoretical Physics. Uh, he's a postdoc there. Before that, he was a postdoc, uh, joint postdoc from Princeton University and uh, Institute of Advanced Studies, Princeton. He did his PhD from also Stanford University. Uh, his area of expertise is condensed matter physics, quantum information theory, and quantum gravity overlap. He will talk about a very interesting uh, thing, which is at present very hot topic of research. And uh, he will talk about a tutorial on entanglement island computation. So, Raghu, you can start, and uh, it's a very great, great pleasure for us uh, that you have agreed to give the 42th QSTM Zoominar series. And uh, we are all welcoming you from Potsdam. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thanks a lot, Sayant, and for the invitation. Um, okay, so my talk is a tutorial, and that is what uh, it is meant uh, to be. Starting, uh, Levy, I just want to interrupt because uh, for the archive purpose, I just uh, take a pic of the. Uh, okay. Yeah, please. Okay, good. Sorry. Now you can continue. Okay, great. So it is really meant to be a tutorial and uh, to be interactive and I really will go through one computation in a lot of detail and then mention some others. So please think of this as a classroom lecture and ask lots of questions. Uh, that's the goal. Okay, so this uh, talk is based on some work I did last uh, year uh, in October, November with uh, Ahmed Almeri, Juan Maldacena, Jing Zhao, and George Santos. There were three papers and you can find them on archive. And I have to mention that there was earlier work by Pennington, uh, Maxfield, Marolf, and Engelhardt, and also some follow-up works in November by these authors. And there are many other uh, uh, works on the same theme. Uh, yeah, so I will not uh, try to cover the whole swath of results and their implications, because now many of the talks have been given by these preceding authors. And for example, the workshop in IAS last December, the January and February, the KITP quantum gravity program this year. Fortunately, and the, I was there in this IAS December workshop. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, yes, yes, yeah. Right, so a lot of things were discussed there. So, and all these videos are online, and especially the pedagogical lectures in the ICTP spring school, well, now it became summer school that concluded recently. So I encourage you to also look at these videos for more big picture questions and some more details than what I will be presenting. Okay, so basically this talk will be about quantum extremal surfaces. They are the sort of the main character in this, uh, in this talk. And uh, these are, surfaces that are introduced by Engelhardt and Wall about six, six years ago. Okay, so the, the setup is that we want to compute entanglement entropies in gauge gravity duality, ADS-CFT um, or gauge gravity duality. Okay, so what do we have here? On the left, we have some picture of uh, ADS, D plus one. So little d for me will always be the boundary space-time dimension. I have drawn a boundary theory. And the white circle uh, in the middle is the spatial manifold of the boundary. Here, it's drawn as a circle. And B in red is some subregion of the boundary. And since it's a subregion, it's not in a pure state. We will take the global state of the field theory to be pure. So B has some entanglement entropy. And we would like to compute it. Uh, the other question one would like to answer is that gauge gravity duality is not just say that the full ADS is dual to the full boundary. There is also some finer substructure to it. That is the region B itself is dual to some piece of the bulk. So pieces of the boundary are dual to pieces of the bulk and we would like to make this map, uh, describe how this map works. Okay, so the way it works is you're supposed to start with a a co-dimension two surface in the gravity region. That's A here. 
okay? And this is some general co-dimension two surface that ends where B ends. So the endpoints of A and B have to be the same, like in this picture. And what the rule says, this Engelhard wall rule says that you are supposed to construct this function. It's def this is a definition, this is not some equation. This is just the definition of S-gen or generalized entropy. It's like the area over 4G Newton, uh, that's the, you know, you, that's the famous uh, Rutakyanagi term or the Bekenstein Hawking term. But you're supposed to also add the bulk matter entropy in this hatched region. So there are some bulk quantum fields like gravitons and so on living in this shaded region, and you're supposed to add their entropy. Now, of course, this combination was considered by Bekenstein because he wanted to explain the second law of thermodynamics when a black hole evaporates because then the area decreases but the matter entropy outside the black hole is increasing so this this combination goes back to that but what Engelhardt and Wall said is that one should really minimize over all possible choices of a so we construct this s gen of a for all a and then we compute the minimum and that quantity is equal to the entanglement entropy of the region B on the boundary. Okay, so that's one part of the result. The other part is that if we call A star to be the minimizing surface, then the gravity subregion, which is dual to B, is the region between A star and B. Okay, so if you go back, if we go back to this picture, and you know we say now think that this a is really a star then the sub region of the bulk which is dual to the b is this region the hatched region bounded between a star and b okay so these are two sort of pieces of the result and in some sense as we will see the second one is actually more robust because uh, yeah i mean both are robust but the first one has some subtleties that have not yet been explained fully in the literature. So are there any questions about this? This is the very basic fundamental setup. Okay. Any question, please ask if you have. Yeah. I don't uh, think so. Okay. Okay, great. Uh, okay, great. So we move on. So one question why I say that the entropy computations are a bit subtle is, is that we know that bulk uh, matter entropy or any entropy has a UV divergence, so it's not finite. Uh, but the claim is that the combination area plus S bulk is actually finite. And so what's the reason? The reason is that the, the divergence in, uh, in S bulk is something like area divided by epsilon squared, where epsilon is some UV cutoff. And, but the other term, you know, the bare term is area over G Newton. So this is actually interpreted as uh, a renormalization of G Newton. So one should call really this as the, you know, the full Newton's constant. Whereas the original one you start with is the bare one. So, so that's the idea going back to Saskain and Uglum that the area divergences of entanglement entropy are precisely the one loop uh, you know, beta function renormalization of the Newton constant. Okay, I hope, uh, yeah. So, but I think this proposition has been, I would say that uh, it's, it's not 100% solid. Okay, also, uh, because bulk matter, uh, you know, also contains graviton. And the graviton contributions are not well understood because on the one hand, you might think they're contributing to the area. And on the other hand, you might think that, oh, they're contributing to the matter. So, so that's why it's a little bit uh, unclear, but there is a trick for it. The trick is you just take the bulk matter to have a large number of degrees of freedom because you will just have two or three polarizations of gravitons depending on the dimension you're in. So if you take the bulk matter to have, let's say, a central charge C, which is much greater than one, but still to have the matter sector not be, you know, dominate over the gravity, we should also keep it much less than N squared, where um, 
you know, n squared is like one over g nu. So this is always the regime we will be working in. So the matter contributions to the entropy actually overwhelm the graviton contribution and we can ignore them. Okay, so with these two caveats, I would also like to say in general, you know, S bulk is impossible to compute. Like we don't even know what the entropy of a scalar field theory is in three dimensions or higher. Um, okay, so you might say the Ruta Kenagi formula was useful because it just is some area computation. What are we going to do with this area plus S bulk? I mean, you know, and you're supposed to compute it for all possible A and then extremize. So you might think this is completely hopeless and we should just not do anything with it. But okay, there are two scenarios in which uh, you can actually compute S bulk and that is when, let's say you had a two dimensional bulk. So you have a 2D gravity theory and on top of it, you have some 2D uh, conformal field theory that is playing the role of your matter. And there we have these Cardi Calabrese formulas for the entanglement entropy and we can make some mileage. And actually this was already studied in a paper by Fiola, Preskill, Strominger, and Trivedi in 1994 in the context of the two-dimensional CGHS model. And uh, more recently, it was revived by these authors, Almeri, Engelhardt, Merals, and Maxfield in this paper from May. So, Raghu, I have a question. So yes. In this two dimension, this gravity is not a dynamical thing. So it has uh, to couple with the matter? Yeah, so actually it is not pure gravity uh, because you know 2D Einstein gravity is topological. Yeah. We have what is called dilaton gravity. So yeah. the gravity sector is made up of a metric and a scalar. Yes. So that kind of mimics a 3D gravity setup. Okay. So I will show the Lagrangian and the theories later sure 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 yeah but it's exactly like in the cghs model there is a scalar the dilaton and then the metric which which is like uh, which does not have gravitons but it does have you know non-trivial solutions like finite temperature solutions okay thanks and uh, there's a second scenario which we will discuss later if we if we get the if we get the time okay Okay, so now I'm just going to take some simple examples from my paper with Ahmed and Juan uh, from... So, okay. Sorry, sorry yes. for the interruption. So yeah, uh, yeah. you have mentioned about 2D. So you have also done work on the higher dimensional generalization. Right, right. That's this scenario too. And if oh, we have time, okay. we can get to it. Okay. Yeah, okay. Exactly. Okay. Right. So, so now I will discuss some simple examples in this ADS2 JT gravity. Um, okay, so this is a theory of gravity which has these two fields, as I was just saying. If there's a scalar phi and a 2D metric G, and its action has this first term. So usually you would just have some R plus 2 lambda, but here the R plus 2 lambda term is multiplied by phi. That's the first term. And the second term is some kind of Gibbons Hawking boundary term because we always need that. Okay, so this is just a very simple action. And it's especially simple because when you take delta delta phi in the action, you just set r plus two equal to zero. And in 2D, knowing the Ricci scalar is, is good enough to fix the metric completely locally, not globally. We don't know what the global is, but we'll take ADS2 coordinates. So this will be ADS2, okay. But uh, you know, delta delta g, mu nu will still give some non-trivial equations. This will give some equations like grad mu, grad nu phi equals zero if it's, there's no matter or equals t mu nu if there's some additional matter. So this is schematic, there are some, some other terms here. Okay, so here we have to discuss um, some length scales. So epsilon here, which also appears in the, in, in the, in this Gibbons Hawking term is a UV cutoff and it has dimensions of length. So phi r in this, this quantity phi r also has units of length. And of course, G Newton in two dimensions is dimensionless. So this quantity phi r will appear and I want to just emphasize that it has dimensions of length. Later when we do computations, this phi r will play 
a crucial role. Okay, it's not just enough to specify the Lagrangian, it's also good, we also have to specify the boundary condition. And in Lorentzian time, the boundary conditions are just Dirichlet boundary condition for the metric. So this is the boundary metric and we make it large because ADS2 is large near the boundary. And the dilaton is also large. So phi r is some order one number. You should think of it as like that. And epsilon is some UV cutoff. So the dilaton is also very big near the boundary and we put some Dirichlet boundary conditions for it as well. Okay, so I have two comments before proceeding. So because uh, these, you know, uh, Bekenstein-Hawking formulas and the Ryutake-Nagi formulas or the quantum extremal surface formulas involve co-dimension two surfaces. Here, co-dimension two just means it's a point. The, the, the A, the surface A we were talking about, will just be a point or maybe a set of points, right? Uh, that's the dimensionality. And so the common two is, what do we mean by the area of a point? So here, actually, the area of A, which is a point, means the value of the scalar phi at that point. Because you see, it, the scalar phi is what multiplies the two-dimensional Ricci scalar. So if you were in, let's say, some four-dimensional setup, and you did a dimensional reduction down to T and R, the two-sphere, the transverse two-sphere, will precisely sit where this phi is sitting. So, so that's why you, you, know, you can justify this more rigorously, but that's morally why the area term gets replaced by the value of the dilaton at that point. And since G Newton is dimensionless, I will also set from now on for G Newton to one. So you will see formulas like generalized entropy equals phi plus S bar. Okay, are there any questions about the Lagrangian or boundary conditions? Okay, let me go on. Uh, so here is a very simple solution for, for these two you know, dynamical fields that we have in our theory. So the metric is just a Poincaré uh, uh, vacuum, just Poincaré ADS2. And I will be taking X negative for reasons I will explain later. Usually X is positive, the, the, cause Z usually. And the dilaton actually has just a one over negative X behavior. So it's positive because x was negative, and you see the boundary is at x equals zero, so it's getting big there. So our boundary would be at x equals negative epsilon. And I have also defined these light cone coordinates here. Uh, these light cone coordinates, t plus x and t minus x. So let's look at what this looks like. So the picture on the left, we have this point O. That's where I'm putting the origin of my coordinates. X goes to the right and T goes up. So you see that the ADS Poincaré patch is at negative X. And this, uh, this, this line is, is the cutoff surface. It says X equals negative epsilon. And the dual of the system is just a quantum mechanic. So I drew this dot here, this circle here with many dots to show that this is perhaps some SYK model with lots of fermions. So we have like N fermions and they're just there is no spatial structure and they're just moving in time. So this direction is time. Okay, and the state in this ADS uh, uh, Poincaré patch, the, it means that we are looking at the vacuum state of the, of the dual theory. Okay, but in contravit, we also have to add in some matter fields. So that's this Lagrangian of a CFT. Chi will be a CFT field and we take it to couple just to G, not to phi. So this is just a simple choice. And okay, so, so that will be our model. We don't need to say anything more about what the CFT is, except it has central charge C, which obeys the condition I, I said previously. Okay, so now I would like to just review these uh, entanglement entropy formulas in CFT2. So A, B is some, just now we think of field theory for the next five minutes, just some two dimensional field theory, no gravity, no, yeah, exactly. So we have some A, B, which is a space-like line segment. Usually A and B are taken to be horizontal 
you know, in the standard Minkowski coordinates. And there we know the famous formula that the entanglement entropy goes like C over three times log L. And it's divided by the UV cutoff. So I want to massage this formula now. The first step is to make it relativistic. Uh, and it's that simple to do. If we are in some vacuum state, the, the state is, you know, Poincaré invariant, we can make a boost. And so we divide by two and multiply by two. That would give C over six log of L squared. And the generalization of L squared is to delta X plus and delta X minus. That's what L squared would be if the time separation was not zero. Okay, so this is in flat space. And now I have just separated the X plus and X minus as logs. Note that the coefficient of these individual logs is C over six because we went from C over three to C over six here. Okay, but uh, we also have to include something else. And the something else is because in general, we will not be in flat space, we will be in curved space, and where the metric will have this while factor, this one over omega squared times this thing. And we get some contributions from the endpoint. So omega of A is the value of the while factor at point A, and omega B is the value of the while factor at point B. And they come with the C over six coefficient and a minus sign. So why does this arise? There are two ways to think about it. One is that we should always put some proper cutoff, right? So if we want the cutoffs to be constant in the DS squared, the full metric, then the coordinate cutoffs, you know, the coordinate cutoff should be omega times epsilon so that the omega in the dx plus sort of cancels in the denominator, cancels with the omega in the denominator. So that's one reason. The other reason is in 2D CFT, the entanglement entropies are computed by correlation functions of some twist operators. So we first compute the Rennie entropies, which are some correlation functions. And we know that when we have curved space time, correlation functions of local operators pick up factors like the while factor to the dimension. So when you take the n goes to one limit, that leaves the remnant, these logs of omega. Okay, are there any questions about this? Uh, any about questions, these? guys, please ask. I think no questions. Okay, okay, okay you okay. proceed. Uh, yeah, yeah, no worries. Okay, so let us compute some entanglement wedge. Let us put the, uh, angle heart wall formula to work and let's see what we can compute. So the boundary is just a single spatial point. So we can only compute here. There is no subregion, right? There is just the B is the full theory. So we can only compute the entanglement wedge of the entire boundary. And since it's the full boundary, we had better find that the entanglement wedge is the entire point array patch, right? Otherwise there would be just something weird with this duality. Okay, and but there is one final caveat, which is that ADS2 has a boundary, right? So it's not a CFT on R11, it's on half a line. It's not on the full line. So as is familiar, like in BCFT, the left and right movers get identified. And so we had this separate contribution from delta X plus and delta X minus. We will only get one of those terms because of the boundary, okay? So that's the second last caveat. Okay, so now we try. We have our point B, the boundary point, which has coordinates zero comma zero. And we try to find the extreme, which has coordinates X and minus X. Now these are light cone coordinates. So remember X plus was T plus X and X minus was T minus X and T is zero. So that's why A has coordinates X and minus X. Uh, okay, so let's write our generalized entropy, uh, you know, expression. So there is a dilaton. Let me erase this for now. So we have the dilaton, which is phi r over negative x, right? That was the just the background solution. We have plus term here, which comes from uh, this term comes from just the matter contribution, the c over six log of delta x minus, right? The coordinate separation between these two is x, x minus zero is x. 
and then we have a c over six log of the while factor at a because we are not varying with the point b i'm not going to write the omega of b because our goal in the end is to take a derivative with respect to x so we are not going to worry about omega of b okay but you see what is omega a right the metric was just negative dt square plus dx square over x squared so omega is just equal to negative x uh, right because we had a one over omega squared this in general was omega squared okay so we see that this term and this term just cancel because omega is equal to x so our generalized entropy functional becomes just phi r over negative x it's very simple and okay we take a derivative set it to zero what do we get we get it's minimized at x equals minus infinity okay so we have done our first quantum extremal surface computation and what this means is of course that the entanglement wedge of the point b is this entire poincare patch the the quantum extremal surface is all the way to the poincare horizon this is the point x equals negative infinity so this makes sense and uh, we have not made any mistakes okay uh, questions about this guys please ask question okay no worries it's, yeah it's maybe it's yeah yeah no no it's okay if people have questions they will just naturally ask or we don't have to if it is clear it's okay um okay so now we are going to do something interesting which is that we are going to take our syk fermions we have all these fermions here and we're going to couple them to some wire this wire is some quantum system which might be a cft or whatever and we just want to couple it and the reason is you know if the syk model is sort of uh, has a finite temperature state for example that would be dual to a black hole in ads and ADS black holes don't evaporate because ADS is like this box and the radiation just falls back and it's in a thermal equilibrium with the black hole. Um, but if we have a wire, the energy can leak into the wire. So that's like how we can make ADS black holes evaporate. Okay, so that's the motivation. And so we have this quantum dot and we couple it to the wire. So now we want to make a guess to what the gravity dual of the system is. And it's just natural because earlier the SYK dot was nucleating the space, you know, to the left of this, this vertical line. When we add in the wire, it just adds on a region of flat space to the right side. Okay, so this, this, this here is flat space on this side and here on the left side we have ads2 and we still have some boundaries so actually the 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 joining of flat space and ads happens along the green line so now we have some ads space and coupled to flat space and this is not just flat space the the phi and g are don't exist the dilaton just stops existing at the green line and there is no more dilaton on the right hand side and there is no metric. The metric is there, it's just flat, but it's not fluctuating, it's not dynamical. It's not an integrated over in the functional integral on the right hand side. And, and here I've drawn the dual, like the SYK plus wire, and we go forwards in time. Okay, and because now we are doing this kind of hybrid thing where part of the system is holographic and part of it is not, it is very important to keep track of and all the entanglement entropies will be defined in this system in the dual honest quantum mechanical system because that's when we don't get confused we don't understand gravity so that's why we try to define everything you know, using the quant yeah is there a question okay no and the state that we will use is the zero temperature joint coupled state so we have these two systems that are coupled and we will put them in a t equal to zero coupled ground state and now we want to explore what happens to the entanglement wedges from as compared to before okay uh, 
well, there is one small caveat is that we take the wire to be built from the same CFT2 that was propagating on ADS2. It just makes life simpler in order to compute the formulas. And it's just like, we get interesting stuff already with this setup, so we don't have to you know, do something more fancy. And the only difference from before now is that since we have this full space, it's not, this, this gravity theory is not on a half space anymore. You know, the particles can, don't bounce back, they just go through, right? We supply transparent boundary conditions here. So now the left movers and right movers are just independent from each other. And in the entanglement entropy formula that I showed, we will get a contribution from the left mover and an independent contribution from the right mover. Okay. And we are still going to compute the entanglement wedge of this point, just the SYK dot, no wire. Okay, so we try again our generalized entropy formula. We still have the dilaton, that's pi r over negative x. We have our coordinate separations, the c over six log of minus x. But now we have this factor of two because we have one contribution from delta x plus and one contribution from delta x minus. And we still have this while factor. There's just one of that, there's not two because it's just, the b is independent, the log omega b is independent of x. So you see now the logs no longer cancel. You have phi r over negative x plus c over six log of negative x. Okay, so we are supposed to minimize this. And when we take a derivative, we get one over x squared and one over x. And when is that's zero at some negative value of x, right? So the function looks like this. And this has a non-trivial extremum. X is like negative phi r six over c. And that is some finite value here, right? You see, we have some A star now is not all the way at the very end. It, it's here, it's some finite location. So what that means is that the entanglement wedge of this blue guy of this, of this region here, just the SYK dot is reduced from before. Earlier, it was the whole Poincaré patch. Now it has become smaller, okay? Okay, and this point I already emphasized before. So this is the, the big difference. So earlier, the SYK was nucleating the entire gravity region you know, because that was the dual system. Now, because of this wire, which actually did not have any holographic dual itself, has managed to shrink the entanglement wedge of this uh, SYK system. Okay, uh, why is that so weird? That doesn't seem so weird. I mean, you coupled it to something else, so, so what's the big deal? Um, okay, the point is, let's look at the entanglement wedge of the complement. So this is the complement region. As I said, like all the entropies are defined in this, in this SYK plus wire picture. And we have this, the complement is this blue region here. You see, because the global state is pure, the SYK plus wire has to nucleate the full space. So there is a Cauchy slice, which goes like, like that, right? And the full um, dual is, is the full thing. So that means that, you know, the complement, so earlier, the, in, the spatial intersection, um, all I'm saying is this, this is red line here between A star and B covered only a piece of the Cauchy slice between A star and B. So the rest of it has to be dual to the, to the complement, which is the wire, right? So we get uh, a blue region here, like, uh, like this guy, is, is the naive entanglement wedge. That's like, you know, the light ones of the far away region over here. We, we get this region here. It's very far from this wire. This is the wire region, the naive wire. It's very far, but somehow what we are saying is that the union of the two blue diamonds on the left, the, this diamond union, this diamond, the total is dual to the wire. So, so this is sort of some weird thing from, if you look at it this way. It's like, what business did this wire region have with the deep interior of ADS? Okay, but it's true and it's just uh, forced upon us by P 
purity of the state and the quantum extremal formulas, and we must accept it. So this, this region here, we have called the island region, something that you would not have naively expected to be in the entanglement wedge. Uh, okay. Okay, so this is like a good point to stop for questions. So, uh, hello. Uh, yeah. May I ask a question? Uh -huh. So, uh, my point is, uh, I want to ask. Uh, so, the wire is basically the two blue diamonds, right? So, can you distinguish the, those two regions on the wire? Like, is it possible? Yes. Yes. Yes, you can. So. So we have, you know, in this entanglement wedge, we have this thing called reconstruction of operators. Right. So let's say we have two situations. I make some simple excitation here in this region, right? And okay. ask, what is the dual? What is the dual description? The dual description will be, again, some simple operator here. It might look slightly different, but it basically looks the same. It's okay. important that it's not exactly the same, but nevertheless, it will be something simple. But let's, on the other hand, make a simple excitation in this island region here. Let me make yes. some simple excitation now here. Yes. This guy will be actually be dual to something highly complicated and non-local. That's the difference. The difference is in the details of the dictionary that you use to reconstruct them. And it's because uh the usual story is that entanglement wedge can usually be bigger than the causal wedge and reconstruction of operators that are not in the causal wedge but in the entanglement wedge is very hard and you have to do some modular flow and so on to to reconstruct so this naive region is just a causal wedge and the entanglement wedge is the causal wedge union the diamond union the island region right does Thank that you. make sense? Yes, yeah, yes thanks. Yes, That's yes. a Fine. good question. Yeah. Okay, uh, more questions. This, this is the really the punchline of the uh, Can I ask you a question? Yeah, please. Yeah. Um, in, I'm, I'm working on uh, conformal cosmic cosmology, uh, cyclic cosmology, uh, proposed by Roger Sandro. Can you, Sorry, can you speak uh, properly? Uh, I can't able to hear audio, you. Yeah, the, the audio is not clear. There is some noise. Yeah, so could you please uh, speak properly? I don't know the, what is the source of the noise. Is it clear now? No, 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 it's not coming properly. Maybe you can type it. So if it is uh, clear, please write in the chat box. That's okay. There is other question. What? Okay, okay, Raghu, I don't think so. There is a question right now. If they have questions, just they will put in the yeah. chat box for this. Yeah, question. Natarajan, it was Natarajan, right? Yeah, you can just write in the chat and we can answer it in a few minutes. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, all right, so. So this is the weird thing I just want to emphasize again. There's this entanglement wedge of a completely non-gravitation region contains some region which is far from itself near the Poincaré horizon. And I take this to be another of several hints that gravity theories are have non-local effects. That's not a new observation, but this is just another illustration of that effect. Okay, so now there is a small generalization we can make in order to show some more, you know, that it's satisfying some simple consistency checks. So now let's compute the entanglement of this K, but a little bit of the wire. So we put our uh, B region, this is the B region now, from the SYK to this endpoint here. And we again, uh, the goal is to compute the entanglement wedge. Uh, may I interrupt here just uh, yeah, yeah, please. a little bit? Uh, so, like, why do you want to include this region? Like, what is your idea? What What are you trying to check here? Like, why do you want to include that small region? You will see. I'm going to describe that. Okay, okay, fine. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so B is just some number, real number greater than zero. Earlier, we had B was like zero and something 
things are small and positive. Okay, so now we have the situation here. We have our point B, we have our candidate uh, extremal surface A. These are their coordinates, uh, right? B, B, B minus B and minus A, A. And okay, so these are, this is again, I remind you, X, these are not T and X, these are X plus and X minus coordinates. Okay, so now you see what delta X plus is like B plus A and delta X minus is B is negative B negative A. So the generalized entropy is going to be phi R over A, that's the dilaton, two, because we still have independent left and right movers, log of the coordinate separations, A plus B, and then we have negative C over six log A from the Weyl factor, this is omega of A, right? So you see now we have slightly more different functions because of this plus B here. And what this will do is just will give some different extremization condition. We get a one over A squared from the dilaton derivative. The matter entropy derivative gives the A plus B and the Weyl factor just gives an A. Okay, so you get some, some extremization equation for A star. It's some quadratic equation that you can solve. Okay, but uh, it's instructive to look at two limits. The first is the B equals zero limit, which was before. And of course, we will recover the result of what we found. But if you take now B to be very large, then A will also become very large. It will be B plus a small thing. You know, what this means is that as you take this point B to be further and further to the right, the point A moves further and further inwards. And this is a good consistency check because when B is all the way to infinity, we have included the entire SYK plus the whole wire, right? So that should be dual to the full system. And that is what is represented by the A going to negative infinity on the point A moving off to the left side edge of the wire. So this again sort of recovers the purity. And that's what we learned by doing this exercise is just that these uh, entanglement wedge you know, formulas, the quantum extremal surface is smart. You know, so it's not just, I mean, yeah, it fits all the consistency checks. That's all I had to say uh, about this, this, this small generalization. Prabhu, your question came. Should I uh, read okay. that? Uh, let, let me, I can see. So can we deal with these disconnected remote regions as consecutive? cycles of universe. Uh, I, I don't think so. This is sort of spatially separated. So I don't know this model, but an important difference is that uh, the, this, this island region and the naive causal wedge are space-like separated. You can't send a signal from one to the other. So this is not like past and future. This is like left-hand side and right-hand side, and there's they're space-like separated. Okay, I hope that is uh, answers the question. Uh, okay. Uh, all right, so where were we? Okay, good. Um, here, I just want to also make a point, again, a consistency check, which is if you look at this extremization equation, you see that the left hand side is positive, so the right hand side had a better also be positive, and what that means is that A star has to be bigger than B. And you see that's why we had A star equals B plus a little bit. And this actually is a consequence of the quantum focusing conjecture. So again, we see that we are doing some some steps, and you know we we, we should be careful because we are dropping some infinite x independent constants and so on, but it here. Okay, anyway, so that's the zero temperature story. So just to summarize what we did, we started with the zero temperature pure SYK. We found that the entanglement wedge was the entire ADS two point array patch. Then we wanted to, you know, somehow introduce subsystems in, in a one dimensional boundary that's not possible. So we coupled the SYK to a wire with the eventual goal of trying to connect it to evaporating ADS black holes. And we found that the entanglement wedge of just the SYK has shrunk, that's one. But then we also find that the entanglement wedge of the complement region, 
which is just some piece of the wire and it's completely non-gravitating, there's the, the naive causal wedge of that region, but plus the entanglement wedge of that wire includes an island deep in the ADS bulk next to the Poincaré horizon. Okay, so that's a summary of what we have done so far. And now we will generalize the story to non-zero temperature. We will be quick now. I will not present all the details, but uh, the story is going to be very similar. Okay, so now we have two SYKs. We have this left SYK and the right SYK. Okay, because we want to put them in some thermophile double state. But we also put the wires in a thermophile double state. So what has happened now is that this left SYK and the sorry, the right SYK and the right wire are in thermal equilibrium. They form some thermal thermal density matrix of the couple system at temperature beta. And the left system is uh, is the thermophile purification of that. So that is going to be our setup. And what's the dual? So if we didn't have these wires, right, our dual would be some black hole. It would be, this would be the left ADS boundary. This would be the right ADS boundary. And we would have these Rindler horizons here, right? And in yellow, I have drawn the original Poincaré patch. So the finite temperature is sort of covers a smaller region of the space, but it has this other. So this, this thing is the Rindler, Rindler ADS patch, okay? And we now get a left boundary and we get a right boundary. But since we have coupled in the wire, we get these flat space regions. So we have an ADS black hole, a two-sided ADS black hole, and each of them is coupled to some, some Bach region, some flat space region. Okay. Uh, now, first we have to review the solution, right? The earlier solution that we presented for J gravity was the zero temperature one and now we have to do the finite temperature one the metric is the same because the metric locally is not dynamic so it's just the uh, x plus so remember x x plus minus x minus is 2x so so this is why i wrote the metric like x plus minus x minus squared and we just make a change of coordinates to be like x equals tanch of y something like that with some betas. So that just takes us to the second line. The metric becomes one over cinch squared with this coordinate transformation. So the metric is not really different. What's different is actually uh, the dilaton profile. So earlier we just had a simple phi r over x, which is like phi r over x plus minus x minus, something like that. But now we get this extra term in the numerator. We get something proportional to the temperature. So, so that, that's what's new. The diloton has a different profile now. So what that means is that the, the, the first term in the generalized entropy, the diloton over 4G, is going to be different now in this background. And what's also different is that the matter is no longer in the ground state, is in some finite temperature state. So we need to compute entropies of a CFT2 at finite temperature. But those are also known because in 2D, a finite temperature state is just a, trans is just a conformal transformation of the, of the vacuum. So that's why CFD2 is nice because it also allows us to compute finite temperature entropies. Okay, and in terms of the, the Y coordinate, this diloton is, is some hyperbolic cotangent of the spatial coordinate. Okay, so now we are going to compute the quantum extremal surface for just the left, I keep saying left, the right SYK. So just right SYK, nothing. To compute the value of A star, okay. And you have to go through some song and dance to compute the entropies properly. And because the conformal map involves some exponentials and these tanches, instead of just getting, you know, one over A, B minus A, you get cinches everywhere. So you get some condition like cinch, Sinch, sinch, and you can solve it for A star. Okay, you again get something, and and again A star is bigger than B because the left hand side here is positive, so the right hand side should have A star minus B positive, and that again satisfies this quantum focusing conjecture. Uh, okay, so that's just a simple generalization, but 
I'm going to skip over this and um, right. So now we are going to come to the physics of this. 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 Uh, this. So now we did that computation. Let's keep that in mind. But now let's consider this region, which is the left wire, um, the left wire from negative infinity to B, and the right wire from B to infinity. So this is like the do the complement to the two black holes together. And we imagine taking this setup and moving time forwards on both sides, right? And as Hartman and Maldacena pointed out in 2012 or something, that uh, a thermo in the thermofield state, moving time forwards on both sides is like some time evolution. There's a non-trivial time evolution and the entropy starts to grow linearly. Okay, so just uh, how this works, um, you can just do exactly the computations just because it's a 2D CFT and we know all the formulas. And what you find is just that at early times, the, there is no such weird disconnected piece and the entanglement wedge is just a causal wedge. So we just get this naive region and this naive region, right? That's the, that's the entanglement wedge of, of this region here. The entanglement wedge of the union of these two is the union of these two blue diamonds. Okay. Okay, but the actual entropy computation. Uh, okay, I'm here. I'm just going through the steps of the computation. But uh, so, just one step is that you have to go to you have to make this conformal transformation, and that's that's given here. You have to go to some coordinate w, which is exponential of the y. But once you do that, um, you find an answer, uh, which is here. This, this is the answer. So you see, it has a log of cosh of t. So if t was like five beta or 10 beta, cosh grows exponentially is e to the t. So you get an entropy which is growing linearly in time. Okay, so that's, that's, that's the correct answer for early times. You have some, some region and it's, it's evolving in time. So it's like a quent state and, and you get an entropy that's growing linearly in time. But what's the problem with this is that the region whose entropy we are computing, like this region, has a complement. The complement is just two SYKs. Okay, we know that the entropy of SYK is bounded by N just because there are N fermions, right? You can't have an entropy that is larger than N. So this linear in time is some kind of an entropy paradox because you are getting some entropy which is growing linearly, but it should have an upper bound. And the reason why you get saved is, again, if you do late times, there's a non-trivial quantum extremal surface that appears. And at late times, the entanglement wedge of the left wire union the right wire is the naive causal region here. The naive causal region here union this, this island piece, okay? And you can just compute that the entropy of this blue union, blue union, blue, does not grow in time. It's actually a constant. So, so we get uh, an entropy curve, which is growing linearly in time, and then it just sort of saturates here. It's said that our, it's, it's a usual uh, story of first order transition. We have a naive quantum extremal surface, which just keeps continuing to grow forever. But then we have a second guy, which is just constant. And at some point, the constant one wins. Okay, so this is how we are saved from an entropy paradox in this situation. Okay, you you might have seen. Um, uh, uh, Raghu, you please uh, mention about the paradox as well, so that other people. Yeah, yeah, the paradox was just that there was an entropy paradox, which was that uh, you know we had this linearly growing entropy for the bath region. Right, but the entropy of the Bath region is equal to the entropy of its complement because we are in a pure state. But the complement has bounded entropy. The complement has an entropy which is bounded here. So if if the correct answer was just you know going on forever along this curve, right? 
that would be problematic because here the entropy is exceeding the maximum allowed value. So that is just like in, in usual discussions, people draw this tent in an evaporating black hole. This is the initial phase of black hole evaporation when the radiation is just becoming more and more thermal, more and more entropic. But you know, at the same time, the black hole area is decreasing. This is the area of the black hole because it's evaporating. And it cannot be that the radiation is entangled with a, a lot of the radiation cannot be entangled with a very small black hole. So again, we are looking at the entropy of a radiation, which is big, but it's in a pure state with some very small system, with a system which has a bounded size, right? So it's, it's very similar to this page curve discussion. It's not going down here because the black hole is not evaporating. It's just some, it's some in a thermal equilibrium state. So, so that's why we get a constant at late times rather than decaying to zero. Okay, and the time at which it happens is like the entropy of the black hole divided by C. Okay, so this is, again, the, the, the crux of the matter is that this appearance of this disconnected piece of the entanglement wedge saves us from an entropy paradox. And this is what we have called an entanglement island. Okay, uh, good time to stop for questions. Guys, ask question. Um, hello, uh, I have a yeah. small question. So, yes, please. Uh, uh, can can I go up a little bit? So, when you talked about non-zero uh, temperature, you have uh, two uh, SYK models there, and uh, uh, you want to consider the outer left and uh, outer right part ah. of, of the wire. Ah, this yeah, this yeah. Uh, this point yeah, yeah. so mm -hmm. uh, in the first model when you talk about uh, only single syk model uh, yeah. this uh, only the right side it had two regions uh, uh, in that uh, entire ways right uh, uh, in ads plus uh, path uh, ways yeah yeah two, two mm -hmm. regions but he, here uh, like uh, naively speaking it should have Two plus two, totally four regions that should contribute to this left side and right side. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Good, good. But uh, uh, when when you uh, mentioned just below, you you say that uh, the contribution here that arise those those come from the only outer left and outer left on outer right. So where are the middle two regions? Like, that's yeah. Let me explain. So let I can draw in this figure. So. If you had two completely decoupled SYK models, right? They were decoupled yes. and they were unentangled. That's important. Right. If they were in separate pure states by themselves, they would have two disconnected space times. But right now, these systems are in an entangled state. So that's this usual story when we have two holographic CFTs and they're entangled in the thermal field double state, they nucleate a connected space. Right, that's okay. the that's the story of the eternal black hole, um, okay. right? So, so when I'm drawing here, uh, this region here between this line and this line is the eternal black yes. hole, and then we okay. attach this side and this side. Does mm -hmm. that does that answer your question? Yes, yes, yes. It is fine. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thanks for the question. Uh, okay. Uh, more questions, uh, right? So I just want to <coughs> introduce this guy. Uh, his name is Abinash, and he is also yeah. from this group QASTM. Uh, uh, yeah. Thank. You. Yeah. Nice. Um, okay. Good. So now I think we are one hour in and I think this higher dimension case is not very different. I have already conveyed uh, all the essential ideas. And so I would like to discuss some more big picture things. Like I would like to skip over the higher dimensional case and because it's very similar. The story is like Hartman Maldacena and you get some island. And the only trick I should say is that how do we compute matter entropy in a higher dimension? So that's very tricky. So you assume that the 
matter itself that is propagating on the black hole background has a holographic dual. So if you had two, so I matter, would uh, suggest Raghu to uh, since it is handwritten. So can you provide the notes, please? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I can send it to you, and you can search. Yeah, it yeah, yeah. For sure. So the, then my, my, you don't need to discuss everything. People can look into that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, yeah. but I just want to say that the trick with which you compute the S bulk term is that you imagine that your matter theory, which is floating on this black hole background, itself has a holographic dual. So it's sort of a doubly holographic system that we discussed in our first paper. And what that does is, is basically S bulk itself becomes a geometric term in the higher dimensional dual. So that's what facilitates the computations is because it's not just that the area term is geometric, but the S bulk term has also become geometrized in the higher dimensional space. So anyway, so now I just want to discuss the physically important case of the evaporating black hole. So here now we just have one SYK, it's at some, it's in some pure, the SYK plus wire is, some, is in some finite energy pure state, finite energy density pure state, so highly excited state. And those are the kind of things we expect to be dual to pure state black holes which are expected to evaporate. So again, the same things happen. We have some Cauchy slice in the bulk, and this is sort of, I have drawn here, this is the ADS boundary, this is the flat space region, these pictures should start being familiar now. We have some radiation region whose fundamental description is here, and whose naive causal wedge is this region here. But at late times, its entanglement wedge of the radiation is not just the causal wedge, it's the causal wedge plus this island in the interior, okay? And now I want to explain intuitively why the island wins at late time, okay? Why is it that the island wins, okay? So, so you see when you include this, decide to include this island, you pay a cost. The cost is the area of the surface of this A star, right? Because earlier that point wasn't there in your entanglement bed. So you were not, you did not have any area term. So you pay a cost, okay, and that's a big cost because the area comes with a one over G Newton and G Newton is small. Okay, so why, why does it, why does the surface win at all? It should just always lose to the knife surface. It wins because the Hawking pair production process sets up a lot of EPR pairs. So this is like Alice's pair, Bob's, Bob's electron. Alice's electron, Bob's electron. Alice's electron, Bob's electron, right? So the naive S bulk of the naive surface is the number of these EPR pairs you have times log two, right? Because each of them has a log two entropy and at late stages of black hole evaporation, you have built up a lot of entanglement. You have like 100 particles inside and 100 particles outside. So the entanglement entropy of the outside particles is 100 log two. But now let's say you try to, you just include in your region, the electrons that Alice had as well. Now you are in a pure state because you included these other electrons. So the S bulk um, you know, of the, of the non-trivial uh, surface is actually zero, right? So even though uh, you lose in area, you save in S bulk. So see, that is why this Engelhardt wall formula is very nice because it exhibits a competition between the area term and the S bulk. And if you're about to get into an entropy paradox, you reduce S bulk by including uh, a disconnected piece in the entanglement bed. Okay, so that's the intuition. Okay, so good. And at this point, like you might be disappointed because, okay, we had this amazing, you know, paradox that this page curve paradox, Hawking's information paradox that we thought might teach us something about quantum gravity and singularity and so on. But we got away with just some sort of semi-classical physics. 
we just had some areas, we computed some semi-classical entropies with formulas we already understand, and we didn't learn anything about the singularity. So, you know, that might be a bit disappointing because ultimately we hope to understand something about the black hole singularity. And the reason is simple, is that this trace rho log rho is a very special number. So here, all we are computing is the entanglement entropy, right? Uh, we are just computing if rho is the density matrix, the entanglement entropy is trace rho log rho. That's just one number. But rho itself as a matrix has a you know, dim dimension of the Hilbert space squared number of entries. So rho is a very big matrix because we have a very big system. Uh, but we haven't computed each single individual entry of that matrix. We have just computed some average, you know, like this trace rho log rho number. And my feeling is that if you insist on computing each single individual matrix element of rho, you will need information about the singularity and you will not be able to do it with just such semi-classical formulas, whether it be quantum extremal surface or whatever. Like you need to involve really non-perturbative quantum gravity and so on. Okay. So just to emphasize it here, okay, you can also maybe compute Rennie entropies that will give you some more information, but still not all the information in row. Okay. Okay, that's all I wanted to say. Thanks. So uh, thank you, Raghu, for me... your nice talk. Yeah, let... And uh, guys, please ask question right now to him if you have anything to specifically ask. Yeah. Abhinash, you want to ask anything? No, I don't have to ask. Okay. I, I was, by the way, reading your paper. Okay, yeah, yeah. I would also recommend if you guys are interested in this topic to watch all the videos that people have. YouTube you know, videos, all the yeah, seminar. Yeah, 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 you also yeah, told me. Yeah. Especially this ICTP school was nice because both Douglas Stanford and uh, Ahmed gave some lectures. So there is some yes, question. Yes. Oh, is this a general question about firewall or you want how does this resolve the firewall paradox? How does the island Resolve the firewall paradox. So the short answer is I don't know. Like so, there is this firewall paradox from 2012, and we are what we are learning here seems to say that the interior region. Uh, there are some details to be worked out, but I think morally this is what is happening: is that this interior region, since it you know is, it's it's not an independent region. So any argument that you make by saying that something was entangled with the interior region is going to be mistaken. And that is what you know, AMPS assumed. AMPS had these three systems, A, B, and C. A was the inside of the horizon, B was just outside the horizon, and C was far away. What we are saying is A and C are really part of the same system. So just this strong subadditivity paradox no longer holds at late time. But Any if you are asking question? about, yeah. Right. And just to say one word, maybe what the firewall paradox was. So let's imagine a black hole, which is past the page time. It is more than half evaporated. So we have, imagine the radiation outside very far away. That's like a, more than half of the black hole has evaporated. And imagine that the horizon is just about to come out. And imagine its partner behind the horizon, right? So, so Hawking radiation is like entangled pairs. One is behind the horizon, one is in front of the horizon. And imagine computing who is the Hawking mode entangled with. On the one hand, it has to be entangled with its partner behind the horizon, because that's just the smoothness of the horizon. Like any region which is smooth has to contain that entanglement. But on the other hand, this Hawking mode must have an entanglement with the radiation because 
when it goes to the radiation, the radiation entropy must go down, right? We are on the downward slope of the stage curve. So what you learn is that this Hawking mode is entangled both with something in the inside and both with something in the radiation. And that is not allowed. The amount of entanglement it needs to have to satisfy both those conditions violates strong subadditivity of entropy. So that is the firewall paradox. And the way we are sort of avoiding it here is we are saying that this inside region wasn't really independent. It's some phantom of the radiation region itself. It doesn't have like an existence of its own, so to speak. Any more question, please ask. If not, then uh, please unmute yourself and give a clap for Raghu. Thanks a lot. So uh, this talk will be posted in the channel that you know, I have already told. And uh, if people have any more question, they may write to you and ask. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can find my email. And... It, it will be yeah. posted always. So with, after seeing this, we can ask questions yeah. or maybe yeah. some comments on your talk so that you can give reply. Yeah, okay. yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, that's the thing. And it's a great pleasure that you have agreed and finally managed to give. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry about last time. I'm really no, no, sorry. It's, it's completely okay. Yeah. And uh, uh, maybe in future we will have you again with some new yeah. topics and yeah, yeah. Okay. ideas. And uh, I'm just stopping the recording. Then.